Good afternoon to one and all. And once again, a special welcome to anyone who is with us this afternoon as a guest or visitor. May the Lord bless us as we worship him together. Let's turn in our hymnals number 209 for our pre-service uh, song. Uh, number 209, Unto the Lord Lift Thankful Voices, and we remain seated to sing the first three stanzas only. Our God calls us to worship with these words from Psalm 105. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, that the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Shall we bow in a moment of silent prayer and prepare our hearts for worship? We continue singing from hymn number 209, Unto the Lord Lift Thankful Voices, and we rise as our song of praise to sing stanzas 4, 5, and 6.
congregation loved by the Lord, receive his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ, in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue to confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed, except that this afternoon we sing it. And so if you would turn to the back cover of the Blue Psalter Hymnal, you'll find there version number one of the Apostles' Creed, set to song, and we'll be singing it to the tune of Psalter Hymnal number 314. Please also turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 44 as we continue to work our way through the Old Testament Psalms. Psalm 44. And Psalm 44 is titled to the chief musician. It is a contemplation of the sons of Korah. And they write, and these are the inspired word of God, uh, given by the Holy Spirit. We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out, but they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them, but it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you favored them. You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. 
Through you we will push down our enemies. Through your name we will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. But you have cast us off and put us to shame. And you do not go out with our armies. You make us turn back from the enemy. And those who hate us have taken spoil for themselves. You have given us up like sheep intended for food and have scattered us among the nations. You sell your people for next to nothing and are not enriched by selling them. You make us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to those all around us. You make us a byword among the nations, a shaking of the head among the peoples. My dishonor is continually before me, and the shame of my face has covered me, because of the voice of him who reproaches and reviles, because of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. But you have severely broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our body clings to the ground. Arise for, your, for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. And in response, let us turn in our hymnals to number 81, God Who Omniscient Art. And let's remain seated to sing the three stanzas of number 81. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to you together as your people, corporately to join our hearts together, united in prayer, to call upon your name and to render to you all praise and adoration and thanksgiving. We thank you that we may be called children of the living God, the God who is almighty, possessing all power, so that you are able to bring about and bring to pass all that your will conceives. We thank you that we are children of the God who is eternal, who has always existed, 
who, had no, who has no beginning or no end, and that we may have eternity implanted in our hearts so that even we may know that this world is not all there is, that we are journeying through this life for a time, but the greater joys await us as believers in Christ Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth in the glory of your presence. We praise you that we may belong to the God who is perfectly wise, who knows all things from beginning to end, and indeed who does not change toward us. You are ever faithful. Your promises that you have made to us remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, you look upon us with great love and tenderness. We thank you that we are uh, looked upon by you as your children and heirs uh, of all that Christ possesses, and that we may with confidence know that in Christ we will possess that crown of righteousness that he has won for us. We bless your name that you are the God who is infinite, whose presence fills the universe, that there is no, not even a square inch of the universe where you do not exist and your presence is not there 100%. You are exalted in the heavens, you are enthroned in your kingship and in your sovereignty, and yet you are fully present with us, your beloved children. Thank you that you have covenanted with us, that you have declared to us that you shall be a God to us and we shall be your people. And thank you for the agent and instrument of the covenant, the covenant that has been established in blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you that he is the perfect covenant keeper, the second Adam, the one who has fulfilled all righteousness for us. And we thank you that you have enabled us to know you by your Holy Spirit that you have drawn us to yourself by your power. You have opened our eyes which were blind, our ears which were deaf. You have turned our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. You have resurrected us when we were spiritually dead. And we thank you, Father, that that is not the end, that you will continue to be with us, that you will preserve us so that we will persevere, as we will see in the fifth head of Doctrine of the Canons of Dort this afternoon. We thank you for uh, these doctrines. We thank you for the creeds and confessions that we may sing or uh, recite together, for the confessions from which we may learn much about our faith as they are faithful summaries of the Holy Scriptures. And we thank you, Father, as this coming Friday we will also remember and celebrate the Reformation. We pray your blessing upon us as we uh, meet together as, as congregations, Lacombe and, and Panoka to view the, Mar uh, the movie of Martin Luther and to remember uh, that after the darkness you did bring light to your church. Thank you for uh, that uh, after many years of, of blindness that you gave sight to your church. And Father, we pray for your continued blessing as your church continues to be, even in light of the Reformation, of uh, the Protestant Reformation, uh, your church continues to be so splintered and fractured and deformed in so many ways, and today uh, in such need of, 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 a, of a reformation again. We uh, think about the churches all around us. We think of ourselves, our weaknesses, our failings. Uh, we think of the tolerance within your church for what you call abominable. Uh, we uh, think of the church in general across North America and around the world, which has been seduced by the culture, uh, containing many who are agnostic, uh, containing teachings of mysticism, where worship has become so man-centered, and we pray indeed, Father, for reformation once again. We pray that your spirit may fall afresh upon your churches, and we pray that we would once again hold you in awe and in reverence, and that we may look to you as our Savior who has saved us when we were lost in sin, that the church may once again regain an understanding of our lostness, of our deadness in sin. We pray, Father, uh, continue to, to um, inspire in us a desire for reformation and for revival. We pray uh, locally here, Father, for your blessing in this regard uh, upon the council, the elders and deacons of this congregation, the office bearers whom you have installed to be uh, overseers, uh, to be watchmen on the tower, to be shepherds of this congregation. We pray for wisdom for these men. We pray for love and concern, for zeal, 
for enthusiasm, for dedication. We pray your blessing upon the deacons as they do their work diligently, uh, administering and ministering the, the, uh, to what the needs of uh, the congregation and uh, the ministries that uh, we seek to support. And we pray your blessing upon the elders, especially during this time of elder visit season. We pray that it may be a time of encouragement for them and also for the congregation and that together we may seek to spur each other on and build each other up in our most holy faith. We pray for the congregation, Father, here for continued spiritual growth. We thank you for faithful attendance at our Bible studies, at our uh, classes, at our various groups, we, and we pray your continued blessing uh, that as we meet together, we may be growing in our faith as we study the books that we have um, undertaken to study, that through these things we would grow in our faith and in our knowledge. We pray that uh, and, uh, through this, this, this growth of faith and knowledge that it would um, uh, that overflow into our living and that we would apply what we are learning to our daily lives. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon our church education and catechism classes on Tuesday nights. We pray for the teachers, uh, for, the, for diligence, for dedication, and for much wisdom as we prepare and as we lead these classes and also for the, for the students and the young ones as they are introduced to the teachings of the Holy Scriptures. May they be um, edified and may they uh, be growing in their faith and that uh, each lesson would be a little stepping stone toward them coming to know you and revering you in their hearts more and more. Father, we thank you for our children. We thank you for each little blessed voice that we have with us, for each uh, of our children who are in the babysit and in, uh, who are toddlers and who are being taken care even now and who will very soon one day join us in worship here again. We thank you also for the blessings uh, upon the wombs of this congregation, for, upon our marriages and families. We pray for those who are with child, for your watchful care over them. Keep them safe through this time uh, where they carry these covenant children. We pray that you would uh, keep them safe and that when the time comes, Father, that you would bless these families with safe deliveries and healthy children. Continue, Father, in this regard as we think of these things to watch over little Brinley and keep her safe and bring her through this, uh, this, uh, this concern with her, her, her health uh, very safely. We pray for our marriages. We pray that you would bless us as husbands and wives, that we may uh, be Christ-like toward each other, that we may be godly examples toward each other, that in every way we may, would seek to build each other up in our, in our faith and that we would be godly examples before the eyes of our children as well as we, in the way we uh, deal with each other as, as spouses and in the way we deal with them as parents. Bless our children. We think of our young people, our young adults, our teenagers. We pray that you would give your spirit to them and that you would uh, ignite faith in their hearts and that you would build on that faith, that, you would, that, that faith would grow and blossom into lives in which you are faithfully worshipped and that, you, uh, that they live before you, making the hard sacrifices, denying themselves and taking up their crosses daily and following you. We pray that uh, our young people uh, struggle with uh, the questions of the faith, uh, uh, facing faith's challenges, that you would help them to understand more about what the Christian faith teaches, what we understand, and assure them by your Holy Spirit that, uh, of the truth of all of these things and uh, use uh, all of these teachings as building blocks for their faith. We pray for our Christian schools and our colleges. We pray for our college students that you would watch over them, bless them in the studies that they are undertaking, and uh, bless them that they may be fruitful in their work and bless them in their Christian experience and that they would uh, have uh, fall into the hands of, uh, of good influences around them. Bless our local Christian schools, Panoka and Lacombe and uh, Cash. We pray, Father, your blessing upon uh, the teachers and staff and uh, uh, those who are involved in boards and, and uh, all other things in the running of the school from day to day. Uh, bless the parents as we seek to faithfully raise our children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Bless our schools that they may uh, be faithful in their calling. Father, this afternoon we also think of uh, our brothers and sisters in smaller congregations, especially as they struggle to meet their uh, financial needs from, from day to day and week to week. Uh, we pray that you would bless them through us. 
We pray that uh, you would be with those needy churches and uh, that you would bless them through the fund for needy churches, that they may be able to meet their obligations and continue to be uh, that beacon in their community. We pray this afternoon that you would bless the preaching of your word as we look at the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. We pray that you would bless this word that has been prepared to the hearts and lives of your people. Grant us understanding. Grant us attentive hearts that we may learn and we may grow in our faith. Keep us safe as well in the coming week in all that we do and help us to remember, as we heard this morning, that we live always in your presence, that you know all things, our very thoughts, words, and deeds, and help us to live before you in such a way that we may always be seeking to bring glory and honor to your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, please turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll be reading from verses 17 to 32 this afternoon as we look, as we begin to look at the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. And uh, we're looking this afternoon at some foundational issues, some foundational questions concerning this doctrine of the uh, perseverance of the saints. We want to look at the presence of remaining sin in us, even after conversion. And uh, here in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, we find a good example of uh, Paul speaking to the church, um, uh, cautioning um, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, encouraging the churches to put off the old man, put on the new, and uh, not to hold on to the sins of the old nature, which still remains such a part of us. Ephesians chapter 4 then, starting at verse 17, Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has no need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Our song of preparation is number 464, Christian, Dost Thou See Them? Let's rise to sing the three stanzas of number 464.
Please also turn with me in the back of the Blue Psalter hymnal to page 109. As this afternoon, we begin to look at the fifth head of doctrine on the perseverance of the saints. Page 109, we'll be looking at articles 1 through 5. And this is our confession as the Christian Church, page 109, article 1. Those whom God, according to His purpose, calls to the communion of His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and regenerates by His Holy Spirit, He also delivers from the dominion and slavery of sin, though in this life He does not deliver them altogether from the body of sin and from the infirmities of the flesh. Article 2. Hence, spring forth the daily sins of infirmity, and blemishes cleave even to the best works of the saints. These are to them a perpetual reason to humiliate themselves before God and to flee for refuge to Christ crucified, to mortify the flesh more and more by the spirit of prayer and by holy exercises of piety, and to press forward to the goal of perfection until at length, delivered from this body of death, they shall reign with the Lamb of God in heaven. Article 3, by reason of these remains of indwelling sin, and also because of the temptations of the world and of Satan, those who are converted could not persevere in that grace if left to their own strength. But God is faithful, who, having conferred grace, mercifully confirms and powerfully preserves them therein, even to the end. Article 4, although the weakness of the flesh cannot prevail against the power of God, who confirms and preserves true believers in a state of grace, yet converts are not always so influenced and actuated by the Spirit of God as not in some particular instances sinfully to deviate from the guidance of divine grace, so as to be seduced by and to comply with the lusts of the flesh. They must, therefore, be constant in watching and prayer that they may not be led into temptation. When these are neglected, they are not only liable to be drawn into great and heinous sins by the flesh, the world, and Satan, but sometimes by the righteous permission of God actually are drawn into these evils. This, the lamentable fall of David, Peter, and other saints described in Holy Scripture demonstrates. Article 5. By such enormous sins, however, they very highly offend God, incur a deadly guilt, grieve the Holy Spirit, interrupt the exercise of faith, very grievously wound their consciences and sometimes for a while lose the sense of God's favor until when they change their course by serious repentance, the light of God's fatherly countenance again shines upon them. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as we said, we're looking at uh, kind of a, an introduction to the, per, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. And this afternoon we're looking at the one of the most troubling aspects of the Christian life, and that is the problem of the sins that we still commit. On the one hand, it's wonderful that we, have, we know that we are saved by the blood of Christ. It's a source of great joy that we know that we possess eternal life. What a blessing it is that we may know that we are already counted among the saints in Christ Jesus, that we are members of Christ's church, that we are citizens of His kingdom. But then we look at ourselves, we look at our lives, and we still see ourselves living as if none of that is true. We look at our lives and we see a lack of consistency in, in godliness and holiness, so much so that at times we might even wonder if we are saved at all. We might even begin to doubt our very salvation when we see uh, the, the, the way we live our lives. Doubts arise about our eternal security because though we are called God's children, we don't act like it quite often. And this is where the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints is such a blessing. Now, we would define the, this, this doctrine as uh, uh, that continual and faithful work of God by His Holy Spirit in which He preserves us so that we persevere to the very end. Okay, so the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints refers to that continual and faithful work of God by His Holy Spirit in which He preserves us so that we persevere to the very end. And here again, we're reminded that it is because our salvation always is and continues to be in God's hands that we can find any comfort in this life. 
Because left to ourselves, we know that we would certainly fall away and be lost. But the God of our salvation will not allow one sheep of his pasture to be lost. He enables us to persevere, to hold fast, to stay the course, so that we will inherit the crown of righteousness that Christ Jesus has won for us. And so this afternoon, we want to lay the foundation for our understanding of this doctrine of the perseverance of the saints by looking at Articles 1 to 5 under this theme, the problem of our remaining sinfulness. The problem of our remaining sinfulness. We'll see in the first place its presence. In the second place, its effects. In the third place, its purposes. Well, let us in the first place consider sin's presence. Article 1 reminds us that even though God has called us and regenerated us, and delivered us from the dominion and slavery of sin. He has not delivered us in this life from the body of sin and from the infirmities of the flesh. Now, we're reminded here, first of all, of what we confessed in our discussion of the doctrine of irresistible grace, that it is God who must draw us by His Spirit so that we would come to Christ. If He left it to us, we said, salvation would stay on the shelf, untouched and ignored, because we, in and of ourselves, would possess no desire nor ability to take hold of that salvation which has been won for us in Christ Jesus. It is God, by His Spirit, who must make us alive when our hearts were dead, spiritually speaking. It is God, by His Spirit, who must replace our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. It is God, by His Spirit, who must bend our wills so that we are then inclined to delight in Christ. It is God who has mercifully and powerfully delivered us, saved us, and rescued us from sin's dominion. Before God made us alive, we were slaves to sin. That's using the language of the Bible itself. Now, first of all, what does it mean to be a slave? Sometimes we think uh, of the word slave as just working hard. We say, well, you know, he worked me like a slave. No, it doesn't necessarily mean working, working you hard. To be a slave, when it's used in the context of the Bible and how the Bible uses it, uses it, to be a slave means that we do the will of another. We do the will of another, and we have no choice in the matter. That's what slavery is about. Someone owns you, you do their will, you do what they say, you don't have a choice in the matter. And that's how we were before the Lord mercifully snatched us from sin's grip. Ephesians 2 describes us as formally walking according to the power of the prince of the air, that is Satan. It speaks of us as fulfilling the desires of the flesh, that is, diligently doing what the old sinful nature desired of us. Listen again to the way Paul describes us before conversion in Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 19. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness and greediness. This is how the unconverted are, apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, uh, walking in the futility of our minds, that is, walking aimlessly, vainly fooling ourselves. Our understanding was darkened. That is, our thinking, our intelligence was hindered from uh, knowing God. We were aliens from the life of God. That is, we were strangers to God. We were cut off from Him. We were ignorant, unknowing, unable to understand things for what they really are. We were blind of heart. Paul describes mankind as being past feeling. That is, having become cold. Our sin no longer bothers us so that we exercise no restraint over it. We have given ourselves over, naturally speaking, uh, to uncleanness and greediness. That is, uh, fallen man um, wholeheartedly embraces the attractions of this world. This is who we were. We were slaves to sin before conversion. Paul describes us in Titus 3 as, as being at one time enslaved by all kinds of passions and desires. In Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 15, the inspired author reminds us that before salvation, we were held in slavery to the devil. The good news is that God has not left us in that state. He has not left us in our bondage, in our slavery to ignorance and blindness, being deceived and deceiving ourselves. He has delivered us from the dominion and slavery to sin. That is what he has done through Christ Jesus. In fact, 
Listen to Romans chapter 8, or John chapter 8, verses 34 to 36. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And so Christ indeed has freed us. He has removed our shackles, as it were. He has broken the chains that bound us. By his precious blood shed for us on the cross, he has ransomed us, freeing us from the dominion of sin. He has, we might say, if we can borrow a phrase from the world's language, taken us out from under sin's spell. He has removed the scales from our eyes. He has given us eyes to see our misery and our need for a Savior. He has caused us to see ourselves for who we really are. Romans chapter 6 uses the same kind of language of slavery. Um, verse, uh, verses 17 to 18 of Romans 6. But God be thanked, Paul writes, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And so, again, we hear it in the Bible. We have been set free from the slavery of sin. Sin is no longer our master and overlord. Christ has broken its power. Whereas before, sin was for us inevitable. We were naturally inclined to all sin. We had no choice in the matter. Sin held the reins, we might say, to our minds and hearts. Now, Christ has freed us so that we might become slaves of righteousness. He has freed us now to serve God. Our stupor has been disrupted. We now see our sin and we hate it and we strive against it. But therein lies the problem, the disturbing presence of sin still living in us. How do we explain that? If Christ has broken the dominion of sin over us, if he has released us from the shackles of sin, why do we still sin? Why does sin still remain present in us? Here's why. Article uh, 1 uh, sums it up for us. God has not delivered us altogether from the body of sin, that is, these human bodies, as Paul would uh, call it, these fleshly tents, he has not delivered us altogether from the body of sin and from its infirmities, its weaknesses. And this is our mutual confession. This is the confession of every Christian. None of us are exempt from this. As we confess in Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 44, even the holiest have only a small beginning of obedience. The greatest saint, saints who ever lived, the giants of the faith, Christians who made grand strides in godliness, still retained the presence of sin in them. In that classic passage in Romans 7, Paul says of himself, wretched man. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. The great, what, to me, the greatest Christian who ever lived. What does he say of himself in Romans 7? Wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body of death? Paul saw himself, and he confesses this in Romans 7, doing what he did not want to do, and not doing what he wanted to do. The Apostle John says, in fact, in 1 John 1, verse 8, and this is speaking for all Christians, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And so that sin is still retained in us. Its presence still remains in us. The Apostle James writes in chapter 3, verse 2 of his letter, we all stumble in many things. And so in the life of the believer, there are two realities with regard to sin. On the one hand, we have the confidence that Christ has conquered Satan and destroyed the power of sin over us. But sadly, there is also the presence of remaining sin. As long as we live in the flesh of these bodies, we will remain weak and vulnerable. Vulnerable not in the sense that we could lose our salvation, but we'll remain vulnerable to sin and temptation. Well, what are sin's effects? How do we see this working out in our lives? And this is what we want to see in the second place as we consider the problem of remaining sinfulness. We're asking, how does remaining sin show itself? And Article 2 speaks of daily sins of infirmity and blemishes which cleave even to the best works of the saints. Well, what is this talking about? It's talking about our daily struggle against the sinful nature. As we said, although God has freed us from the consequences of our sin, He has not removed completely our desire to sin. Sanctification is a process. It's something that begins at our conversion. It will last until the Lord calls us out of this life. And so still, sin still remains in us. 
and, and so there's a constant battle in us to resist sin. As the Holy Spirit seeks to lead us in the way of righteousness, and our fleshly nature seeks to pull us back into the way of ungodliness. We engage in what is called spiritual warfare, in which we have to really strive every day to do what the Lord wants and not what we want to do. And that's why Paul uh, sadly must write to the Ephesian Christians and, and to all of us that we must be putting away things like lying because we still live in the flesh and the flesh is weak and we fall back into the default mode of, of lying very easily. If we think it will avoid conflict, if we don't feel like taking the blame, if we want to impress somebody, even a Christian will lie. It's very clear from Scripture that this is a sin. We're even told that Satan is the father of lies, and yet we still do it, even after conversion. Paul mentions as well anger, not letting the sun go down on our wrath, giving no place to the devil. Now, on the one hand, there is righteous anger. Not all anger is bad. There's righteous anger when God's honor is violated and our souls uh, burn with anger because the Lord's honor, the Lord's name has been taken in, in vain and uh, or the Lord has been, been dishonored in some way. But there is also unrighteous anger, which we experience more often when we feel that our own honor has been violated. And anger really at the heart of it is the wicked child of, of pride and idolatry. When we let, let loose on someone, it, it's because we have lifted ourselves over them, above them in our hearts, and we think that they have no right to question us or challenge us or disobey us or disturb our well-being or in any way go against how we think things should go. And we get angry. And the Bible says that's sin. Stealing as well, Paul mentions in Ephesians uh, 4. Any kind of laziness or shortcuts to stealing, any kind of deceiving others as to the worth of what we're selling them, passing something off as quality when we know it's an inferior product, any kind of shirking of our responsibilities at work or as citizens of this country, even working too hard or working too long so that our wives and children get the beer dregs of our minds and hearts. That's a form of stealing. Paul speaks as well of corrupt words proceeding out of our mouths. And the word translated corrupt in the Greek means foul, putrid, worthless, rotten, disgusting, vile. And so any kind of vile, dirty conversations, any kind of coarse jokes and language, critical, hurtful words are meant to tear down, not to build up, are included in this, under corrupt words. And we could go on in Paul's letter to the Ephesians and find this, uh, the sins of fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. We're warned about all of these things, even as converted Christians. And we could go on and on throughout the New Testament, throughout the Bible. But the point is, not to point out every sin that we commit, but the, the point is that even we as God's people, the holy and beloved of God, we still observe in ourselves these daily sins of infirmity and weakness. And blemishes cleave even to our very best works. A blemish, boys and girls, is a defect. It's a stain, a spot. Sometimes people have blemishes on their face. That's why, that's one of the reasons Mary Kay and, and Avon exist. Because they make things to, to cover up or to remove blemishes. Marks that affect the beauty and the perfection of the face. So too, our best works have blemishes. They are imperfect in that they are never quite pure and untainted. And so, for instance, we might do a good deed, and we even start out with the best intentions, and we don't even realize it, because Jeremiah 17 verse 9 tells us that our hearts are deceitful, but hidden beneath, even the good deeds that we set out to do, hidden beneath are sinful contaminants. Christians do good, but there's also there, that pride that comes with it. We do good deeds, but then we, we kind of like the pats on the back. We like the recognition. And so that's a sin that comes along. That's what blemishes our good works, even uh, all through our lives. If, if halos were real, let's be honest, we'd all want one. You know what I mean by halos? Those little light things, if you've seen those old paintings hanging over people's heads, and they say those are the saints, and they have these little lights hanging over their heads. If those were real, we'd all want one. Because we'd all want people to think, when, when, they, when we walk by, what a saint that person is. We like the, the compliments. And so that's where pride blemishes all our good works. We worship well, but then the sinful nature thinks, 
oh, God must really be pleased with me. We talk to an unbelieving person, and then we have to tell 10 people that we did so. We help somebody, and we either drop subtle hints or outright boast about what we've done. And we do good, expecting that good will be returned to us. One hand washes the other, and so on. These are things we all struggle with and will all through our lives. We still see sin's effects even after we have been regenerated and converted. Article 4 reminds us that if we neglect watching and praying, we even make ourselves more vulnerable to temptation. We are liable, it says, to be drawn into great and heinous sins by the world, our flesh, and the devil. And it holds up David and Peter, who was more holy and beloved of God by, uh, uh, as David, a uh, close follower of Jesus, the rock who confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, Peter. And yet they fell away. They fell into grave sin. And many other uh, saints in the Bible uh, can be used as examples of warning for us that we can, if we're not careful, if we're not watchful, if we're not prayerful, if we're not attending to our spiritual lives, we too can become, uh, or follow the sinful nature and fall into great and heinous sins. And our sins are not victimless crimes. Article 5 reminds us that by these sins, we highly offend God we incur a deadly guilt. We grieve the Holy Spirit, as we heard in Ephesians 4, verse 30. We interrupt the exercise of faith. And th so, in other words, we slow down um, the progress that we should be making in our faith. We wound our consciences. And so instead of being able to put our heads down on the pillow at night without our conscience bothering us, we're worried about all the bad things that we have done uh, to others and in our lives and uh, it causes us to even lose a sense of God's favor for a time. If we indulge in our sins, and if we continue in our sins, that's where it will lead us. We can even get to the point where we lose a sense of God's favor for a time. Well, if that's true, why then does God leave us with this ongoing problem of sin? And that's what we want to see in the third place as we consider the problem of our remaining sin, uh, its purposes. Well, surely... The Lord our God does not leave our sinful inclinations merely to torment us. Surely the Lord our God is not sadistic. And certainly it is not that he thinks that he has done enough. And so now we can very well paddle our own canoe. Article 2 helps us to answer the question. It speaks of the daily sins of infirmity as a perpetual reason to hum humiliate ourselves. That is to humble ourselves before God and to flee to Christ for refuge. And so remaining sins, in other words, serve a purpose. It serves the purpose of a constant reminder of our wretchedness and our need for God's grace. It is as we observe sin in ourselves that any confidence in self is driven back. Our self-righteousness is assaulted and we're goaded on to confess our sins and look more earnestly and thankfully to the cross of Jesus Christ. Remaining sin also causes us to mortify the flesh more and more by prayer and holy exercises of piety. And so, in other words, as we observe our failings, our weaknesses, the sins in our lives, we are daily recommitted. They play a part of recommitting us to defeating them, destroying them. And we do so by more fervent prayer. And so it leads us to pray harder to seek God's help to overcome our vices and temptations as we delve more deeply into God's word and we seek good Christian influences we are uh, uh, fighting back against our sin and if we didn't have that sin in us if we, if we didn't see that sin in us we wouldn't fight that hard we wouldn't seek uh, to grow in our faith that much it even seeks us um, when it speaks of holy exercises of piety I, I think it, it even includes uh, confessing our need to God in song Think, think of some of the glorious, wonderful hymns that are well-favored and, and sung by us that are so meaningful. And when you look at the wording, you know that they come from a heart that was deeply troubled, troubled by, their, by, by sin and temptation in this world. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee, to thee. That's an appeal to God to take hold of my life and keep me going. Help me to persevere in my faith. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, how precious thou art. Go for a closer walk with God. Abide with me. Fast falls the even tide. The darkness deepens. Lord, with me abide. 
These songs come from a heart deeply convicted by our sinfulness, by our lostness, by our helplessness, apart from God's help. And so remaining sin also causes us to mortify the flesh more and more by prayer and holy exercises of piety. It also serves the purpose of causing us to press forward to the goal of perfection. In other words, sin motivates us to strive for greater holiness, to run the race harder that is set before us, to beat our bodies and to bring them into subjection, as Paul says, to keep our eyes on the crown of righteousness that awaits us. We know and we recognize that we've made some improvement, but we realize that there is so much more ground to cover. We've only, in fact, scratched the surface toward Christ-likeness, and so that causes us to strive harder and to push harder and to seek greater righteousness, pushing forward, pressing forward to the goal of perfection. Well, dear children of God, hopefully we have laid the foundation for the more in-depth teaching of irresistible grace, and we'll take it up uh, more uh, next week, Lord willing. And we've looked at the problem of remaining sin, its presence, its effects, its purposes. We've been reminded that remaining sin is a real and distressing fact of life for us, even after conversion. But as we hope to see next time, it is not it, like our remaining sin does not decide or it does not cause us to lose our salvation. God our Father preserves us so that we persevere. Let us then not be discouraged nor surrender to our sin, but persevere in the strength of the one who preserves us and will bring us safely to glory. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that our salvation is never in our hands, that from eternity to eternity you are in control, and we thank you that in your sovereign power and through your faithfulness and love to us, you will preserve us so that we persevere. Father, we recognize that even after conversion, there, there is sin in our lives, troubling sin, sin that distresses us, sin that uh, left dealt with would lead us into even more heinous crimes against you. And yet, Father, we know that this does not decide our fate, that you are the one who holds on to us. You are the one who will bring us to our glorious crown of righteousness that Christ has won for us. Bless us that as we recognize our sin more and more, we would more eagerly look to the Lord Jesus Christ and seek your help and use, indeed, the uh, holy exercises of piety, reading the Holy Scriptures, worshiping, seeking good Christian fellowship, singing songs of faith, that we may be armed more and more to fight against sin and evil in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 430 is our song of application, and let's rise to sing all the stanzas of number 430.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> once again, we continue to worship you by the giving of our offerings as you command us. And we thank you for the opportunity to give to what the work of the Central Alberta Pregnancy Care Center this afternoon, as we know that we live in a culture of death, a culture in which uh, men decide who lives and who dies, and they uh, do not see it significant to recognize that you are the giver of all life. You alone are the taker of life. We thank you that uh, we may support such a work of the Central Alberta Pregnancy Care Center, and we pray that you would bless them as they continue to reach out to those who find themselves in crisis pregnancies, and we pray that uh, uh, more and more as they do their work that... Uh, that uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ also may come to those who uh, use their services and that they may know that, uh, that Jesus ca came so that we would have life and indeed life to the full. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, as we go forward into the week ahead, lift up your hearts to heaven and receive the Lord's blessing as we part. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Our doxology is number 491. <laughs>